Hello and welcome to our webinar today on psychosocial impact assessment. My name is Bridget John and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I, look, I work for the International Association for Impact Assessment or IAIA and we are the leading global network on best practice in the use of impact assessment for informed decision making. Today's presentation is part of a webinar series we recently initiated and I invite you to visit our website to check out the recordings of a few of our recent webinars. Before we jump into today's topic, I have a few items of housekeeping and we'll advance the slides so that you can see those. Uh, it is a 90 minute webinar, uh, so a little bit longer than the ones we've been doing previously. It's being recorded and the recording and the slides will be made available. Afterwards, we will send a link to everyone who has registered for the webinar, uh, and they will. All, everyone registered will get a link to the recording as soon as it's available. We will have a few question and answer sessions partway through, and about ten minutes of questions and answers at the end. Um, you will see the slides and other handouts are available in the control panel under handouts. So if you look on the right side, you'll see an arrow, a triangle, you can click that and you can download the, both the slides and a handout with some other resources available. Our presenter today is Michael Edelstein, PhD. He's been a professor of environmental psychology at Ram Ramapo College in New Jersey, USA since 1974. He's also president of the NGO Orange Environment since 1982. Michael has been doing psychosocial impact assessments since the 1970s, so a long time. He's very experienced, so you're getting the best today. His focus has been on the human impacts from exposure to environmental contamination and significant environmental degradation, including siting of hazardous facilities. So Michael, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bridget. Um, I'm attempting to get, oh, here I now have control over my slides, which is why I hadn't moved them. Um, so um, first of all, thank you to Bridget and to the International Association of Impact Assessment uh, for the opportunity to uh, present to you today on understanding impacts on vulnerable populations through psychosocial impact assessment. Uh, I'm particularly excited by the fact that there are so many uh, uh, attendees from across the world, and I look very much forward to uh, uh, learning what you're up to uh, in the long run uh, so that we can begin a, a global dialogue on this topic. I want to get started focusing on the question of uh, what I've learned from 40 years of working with this topic. And it has to do with uh, what I've re referred to in the past as a culture of con contamination. A modernity, in my view, is marked by a global pattern of victim production. Uh, it's driven by a growth economics that's financed through externalities. And of course, these topics are, are much known and discussed. But in terms of the things I work on, there's some basic rules that follow from that. One is that it's easy to pollute. Uh, but it's hard to clean up. Uh, it's easy to degrade the environment, but difficult to restore it. And it's easy to disrupt health, but hard to regain it. Risk is acceptable if someone else suffers the consequences in this view. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why so many victims are generated. Few involuntarily bear the burden for others. And um, even though that happens on a regular basis, because we're isolated from indications of victimization except when they're reported in the press or they occur in our own lives, we believe that this is a rare phenomenon when in fact it's, it's a very common one and that uh, routine nature of it is not adequately recognized. Uh, so uh, that, thus the need for this topic. So what do I mean by psychosocial impact assessment? Psychosocial impact assessment is part of the field of social impact assessment. Um, and it's a tool for examining how a realized event or a proposed project affects things like people's quality of life, their psychosocial well-being, 
their ability to enjoy their homes, property, environment, relationships, communities. And uh, we examine the stressors that people are exposed to in light of their coping abilities to deal with them. And by focusing on stressors, we're able to relate cause and effect, which turns out to be very useful. What do we use psychosocial impact assessment for? Well, this is a, a tool for documenting the effects on people due to significant adverse changes to their environmental context. Uh, I think of two types of psychosocial impact assessment. The first is retrospective, which examines the impacts of events in progress or that have already occurred, and documenting uh, the harm that's been done, causes of that harm, and suggestions for how to restore victims uh, to their prior uh, quality of life. Uh, with anticipatory psychosocial impact assessment, in the vein of impact assessment, we look at potential harm from a proposed change so that decision makers can be informed in deciding whether to permit the change and what mitigations might be required. So um, if we just want to give an example of what kinds of events we would look at, and these are only examples, in a retroactive impact assessment, we might look at the consequences to pollution incidents, industrial accidents, nuclear accidents, other technological disasters, climate change events, conflict. Uh, retroactive impact assessment is most common in legal proceedings, uh, like toxic torts, uh, but it may occur in a variety of situations. Uh, with anticipatory impacts, uh, the signing of gas or oil pipelines and facilities, building a waste incinerator or erecting a dam, uh, developing hazardous industrial facilities, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in this webinar, I want to, I've already defined psychosocial impact assessment, but I want to see it as an emergent new area of impact assessment. And I want to address um, a, a gap in what I call e-victimization or environmental victimization, uh, a gap in assessing uh, that. I want to describe my own practice in this field and uh, recognize in doing that that many others uh, also have done an incredible work in this area. I, and uh, in focusing on my own work, I in no way mean to ignore theirs. I want to inspire listeners to conduct psychosocial impact assessments in a wide range of situations. I want to model the use of grounded theory and uh, appropriate methods and uh, give a concrete case study. Now, I want to start out with a caution, which is that psychosocial impact assessment is not always done. And that's because, in fact, it's most often not done. Um, there's no explicit mandates in most contexts to do it. It's not part of most social impact assessments. Uh, rarely when um, issues are adjudicated uh, for permit hearings, uh, is this listed as an issue. Uh, when environmental impact statements are done, uh, this is not scoped as an item for assessment. Uh, the agencies that uh, do regulation and uh, uh, run or, or do impact assessments often lack trained staff in this area. They may even have disciplinary blinders where they don't recognize it as important or valid. And uh, even in the case of environmental justice, uh, a category in the United States for assessment, we don't see psychosocial impact assessment done in the context of assessing disappropriate impacts uh, or disproportionate impacts to vulnerable groups. Um, there's also um, the question of if we did these assessments, would it be given weight in, in an administrative context? Would different decisions be made because these assessments were done? And there's a, a variety of uh, administrative rationales that actually get in the way of doing this. Uh, there's the uh, uh, now quite old concept of not in my backyard syndrome which is used to dismiss uh, the public concerns and uh, discussion of impacts as being purely out of self-interest. Um, there's the idea that uh, uh, projects that come forward are often considered to be state-of-the-art and in compliance with the way permits are uh, written, the permit requirements are set up, and therefore any fear about uh, the failure of those systems is considered to be irrational. There's a community benefit uh, framework where uh, administrative uh, decision making believes that if uh, the proprietor or proponent of a project uh, gives community benefits that that offsets 
psychosocial impacts. Um, you get a new uh, fire truck for your community, but you uh, get to smell waste for the next 40 years. Um, there are communication strategies that are used. Uh, for example, having a, a facility uh, in touch with the, the public around the facility, having periodic open houses, an annual picnic, a periodic tour of the facility, and that's supposed to mitigate psychosocial impact. Of course, these things don't work. Um, there's the broader problem of uh, public participation, which is trivialized. Uh, uh, public participation receives a lot of weight in many places, uh, but it's not intended to be a substantive contribution to uh, actual decision making. Uh, and uh, therein lies a gap, which is people can raise issues, but they may not have weight. And finally, there's the issue of regulatory threat, which I'll try and come back to at the end, which is very interesting, which is that because agencies are often matched to um, permitting facilities that meet their mandate, uh, anything that uh, may block the ability to uh, permit those facilities is considered to be a threat. And therefore, psychosocial impact assessment is viewed that way. So for these reasons and others, uh, psychosocial impacts are routinely overlooked or minimized. And one of the consequences of that that we see everywhere is that people, if they can do it, are forced to mobilize to self-assess their own impacts and to advocate for that and to try and self-address those impacts uh, in any way that they can because they realize that this, the process doesn't do it for them. So the question is, a psychosocial impact assessment becomes a means of inserting these questions into the process and giving them weight rather than having them addressed outside the decision-making processes. So let me spend a couple minutes on how I got into psychosocial impact assessment, in a sense, how it became my life mission. In 1970, I began my PhD program in, psych, uh, psycho, uh, in social psychology. And uh, uh, that same year, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act was signed. Uh, NEPA, uh, U.S. Uh, Act, is really the, uh, the framework from which all environmental impact assessment flows from. But it's also a very broad statement of the balance between uh, people's lives and the environment and uh, in a sense, is an early statement of sustainability. And I became very much caught up in this uh, from the beginning of my graduate work. I became an environmental psychologist, a new emergent field at that time. And in 1974, I, I moved to Ramapo College of New Jersey, uh, which had created an interdisciplinary uh, college with a heavy focus on environmental studies. And I remain there to this day. Among the work that I began uh, pursuing while I was at Ramapo in the late 1970s, I attended a very lengthy administrative hearing uh, for a facility called Marion Bluegrass Sod Farm, which involved using human waste as a fertilizer. The local community, particularly farmers around the site, were up in arms against it, and I was struck in sitting through months, literally, of hearings by the disconnect between what people were saying and the ability of the judge and the experts to hear them. Uh, there was no connection, and that fascinated me. Uh, the same year I visited Love Canal. If you're not familiar with Love Canal, it was the poster community in the United States for a contaminated community. And when I visited Love Canal, uh, I was struck by the fact that this was a unique uh, cultural setting that was different than any other setting I had ever seen in my life. And it was one that I wanted to study deeply. The next year, I became an expert witness for the first time in a case, uh, uh, an administrative hearing for the expansion of a landfill called Altori Landfill. And for the first time, I studied a community uh, and I brought uh, testimony into uh, an administrative hearing uh, and began to understand what the issues are in being heard as an expert. Uh, because of that study and the, the written report that I had produced, the next year I was asked to be an expert witness in what turned out to be a very landmark toxic tort case called Ayers versus Jackson Township, brought by people in a community who has, whose water had been contaminated by um, a municipal landfill. And I spent weeks and weeks uh, in Jackson Township interviewing and studying uh, the people and, and how they were affected by the situation. And when I was done, uh, I had a unique opportunity. My dear friend, uh, the environmental sociologist Adeline Gordon-Levine, who had uh, just completed her 
work on Love Canal and was working on her book uh, on that topic was uh, vacationing at the New Jersey Shore, 10 miles from where I was. Uh, I went to visit her and her husband, Murray. I sat under a cabana for a whole day with Addie facing the Atlantic Ocean. And I went through my notes uh, from beginning to end from the work I had done in Jackson and compared what I had found to what Addie had found at Love Canal and the convergence, the, the, the basic coming together of uh, what we had seen in these two different communities was extraordinary. And I began to really have a confidence I've never lost that we can generalize from one of these cases to another if we use the right kind of framework and methodology. And subsequently, I've worked in many toxic torts and uh, administrative hearings uh, for a variety of hazardous facilities. My own experience was broadened subsequently when I had a chance in the 1980s to work on uh, two of the uh, uh, state studies that were done uh, to understand the impact on states that were chosen potentially to be high-level nuclear waste site repository hosts. And that was a very important experience. There were uh, groups of some of the, the best social scientists in the country pulled together to look at this, and I was the psychologist in the room. Uh, I spent a decade studying geologic radon, uh, and then I got also into nuclear disasters, beginning with the Three Mile Island uh, disaster, which I did some work on. I paid a lot of attention subsequently to Chernobyl. I had a chance to visit uh, the communities and interview people around the Pushtim 57 disaster in the Ural Mountains, the world's worst nuclear disaster before Chernobyl. Recently, I spent time interviewing people around the Fukushima Daiichi uh, ongoing disaster. I also had a chance to get into the area of environmental justice at the ground floor before it had a name and, um, and have worked in that area uh, very recently testifying against the expansion of the Indian Point nuclear power plants uh, in New York uh, based on an environmental justice study that I had done. I also had amazing opportunities and continue to, to work with indigenous peoples around the world on a variety of issues. I've also worked on cross-cultural impacts, uh, looking, for example, at, uh, in a project I called Cultures of Contamination, comparing how Russians and Americans deal with contamination. I had a chance to, to get into a bit of work on terrorism impact after the World Trade Center disaster during the study of Lower Manhattan. And since 2011, I've been working on the Aral Sea disaster uh, in Central Asia, uh, the, perhaps the most enlightening uh, advanced climate disaster that we can point to, where the fourth largest inland body of water in the world has pretty much disappeared in 50 years. I've also had a chance to work with an amazing group of PhD students always learning from their work, and also to head a, a nonprofit environmental organization, Orange Environment, from which I learn a great deal with everything that we do. And uh, always in papers and presentations, uh, and when I can in books, I try to present uh, the work that I've done. Uh, these are in a bibliography uh, that I've uh, given, but I think it's, I'm showing this because I think it's important that we share the work that we've done, that these things not just be on file cabinets or computer files relating to obscure studies, but they become part of the literature. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, I can uh, introduce uh, or entertain one or two. Great. We do have a few questions, and we'll take a few of a couple of them. Um, Marissa is asking, Michael, uh, when looking at the history of social impact assessments, the current reasons for not conducting psychosocial impact assessments are similar. Is have you experienced the same? Have you found the same thing? Um, she's talking more broadly about social impact assessment. Yes. Is that what? The, yes. Well, um, you know, in the. Uh, they're, they're different. I don't know where, uh, I can't see where Marissa is from, but the, uh, uh, I think there are very many different contexts. In the United States, social impact assessment is uh, included often as a rhetorical part of environmental impact assessments, uh, and it has relatively little substance. Uh, and um, so I, I see a lot of SIA that's done, but, uh, but without a lot of substance in it. Uh, but there are many contexts in which it's not done at all. And um, so the question is both how does one get SIA done and how does one add substance to it? Because just doing an SIA doesn't mean that you're actually really engaging the issues that the community faces by whatever project is coming forward. That's, that's the real challenge. How do we address that uh, in general for 
Uh, what I'm talking about in SIA is I think we need practitioners who are prepared to do it and we need to really produce documents that are useful to decision makers uh, and uh, really help to explain issues and help to bridge this gap between the community uh, and uh, the decision making process and if we can really um, make an onslaught on that uh, task I think we can uh, perhaps uh, create some acceptability and, and a tendency to want to see these uh, questions addressed. Certainly the public if they know they can go in this direction is going to want to want to have it done. Great. I'll well, take one more question at this time and there will be a couple more opportunities to throw those in. Richard Hill is um, asking from the University of Cape Town, what was convergence between Love Canal and Jackson Township? Well, I mean, Love Canal was a, um, a site which was contaminated by uh, a variety of contaminants, but uh, Myrix was the uh, pesticide that was the original one that was found there, but there were many, many contaminants there. And uh, basically, uh, you had uh, an old canal belt bed that had been filled in by contaminants and covered over, and then a, a, a community was literally built right around it. Uh, and so the people were exposed. Um, in uh, uh, Jackson Township, in the Legler section, people were drinking water that had been contaminated by a municipal landfill. Now, those cases have uh, some real similarities in structure, but they also have some major differences, and they were in different communities and different places. So what's an example? Uh, when Addie and I, uh, for example, talked about women uh, and how women tended to become active in these situations and uh, become really focused on the impacts to their children, um, that, that was uh, a key focus. Uh, the, the demographic group of people who have children versus people who do not. Uh, and who gets really drawn into being very concerned about these issues very quickly. Uh, that was one thing I remember very strongly that we, we, we talked about. But we literally talked about uh, the whole gamut. And uh, when I go through uh, the work that I'll, I'll cover later in the webinar, uh, you'll see that uh, almost everything I talk about, there was, there was some uh, counterpart between the two communities. Okay. We will hold on to the other questions and um, go on with the next part of your presentation, Michael, and we'll break in a, uh, about 10 more minutes and ask some more questions. Back to you. Maven. Okay. Um, so let me talk about theory. Um, I tend to organize my thinking about uh, these uh, communities that I work in uh, around a simple model that is derived from uh, the, the traditional areas of psychology. A lifestyle refers to the behaviors people carry out, recognizing that they're not necessarily totally individualized. Lifescape refers to the cognitive worlds that we live in, and life strain refers to the, uh, the emotional and coping issues that we face in the course of life. Um, in my thinking, I, I tend to use the term environmental turbulence to refer to an event that upsets our normal mode of thinking about our life, our normal mode of how we live, our normal mode of how we uh, cope uh, with life, how we feel about life. So the main areas of the assessment uh, are the following. Uh, lifescape, or the cognitive category, deals with our basic understanding of daily life. And um, uh, all of my work is grounded theory, which means that I was taught this uh, by the people that I interviewed in, in communities, uh, and it, uh, the, the model became clear very quickly. And coming back to the conversation with Addie, this is the kind of thing that came out of those kinds of comparisons, but looking at my own work and comparing it to what others were doing as well. But the lifescape assumptions that we normally have that I tend to focus on are how we think about health, uh, how we feel in control of the world around us, uh, how uh, our homes uh, help us feel secure, uh, how safe we feel in the, in the environment, and how much we trust our social context. And uh, if we look at those lifescape assumptions, and, and in some cases I add other ones uh, if they're appropriate, but if we look at those five, we discover that when turbulence occurs, there is often a shift. And uh, let me just say that in different situations, in different cases, in different cultural environments, the details may be different. 
Uh, but looking at environmental contamination in uh, a U.S. context, uh, Americans tend to be very optimistic about their health until proven otherwise, and contamination is an example of proven otherwise. Uh, after a contamination event, people become very focused in a different way. They're much more pessimistic. People feel an extraordinary sense of personal control over their lives. They have a, a profound loss of control, uh, what I refer to borrowing from Ivan Illich, a sense of being disabled afterwards. Uh, home is a very secure and valued place, but uh, after contamination, there's an inversion of home and place. Uh, the environment is seen as a very benign backdrop to life, but after contamination, it's seen as a malevolent backdrop. We don't, one doesn't know what to trust. Is, is water anywhere safe to drink? Uh, and there's a, even in the most cynical times, there's a high degree of social trust. Uh, people believe that uh, if you need it, um, others will help you. Uh, but um, in these uh, turbulent uh, contamination situations, the, that distrust becomes uh, uh, distrust emerges because, in fact, no one is very helpful, and oftentimes there's a lot of environmental stigma as well. Uh, and again, uh, these play out a bit differently in different situations, but these categories have worked across uh, situations across cultures uh, forming. The second category is uh, lifestyle, the normal activity patterns that we engage in. When turbulence occurs, these change often dramatically. There are are various adjustments and adaptations people are forced to make. Uh, on the left here, I have a diagram from my book, Contaminated Communities, which uh, shows uh, direct impacts around uh, the municipal landfill in Jackson Township. And it just shows that in addition to the groundwater contamination, even long before it was discovered and announced and believed, uh, people were affected by all kinds of direct impacts, uh, for example, smelling foul odors, and that would lead to be, lead to, to uh, lifestyle changes. You, you don't eat out on your patio if uh, it smells like garbage. Uh, That's just one example, but, but there are many, many others. So people become immersed in a new cumulative surround uh, with turbulence, and it varies according to the situation, but their behavior changes accordingly. They adjust to new life conditions, they alter their habits, they, they are subject to a, a loss of normalcy. Uh, for example, they avoid the use of uh, water, perhaps in their homes, perhaps in their communities, um, perhaps in cooking, perhaps in showering, uh, certainly in drinking. Uh, there may be parts of their home that they no longer go into or parts of their property or parts of their community that they're afraid to go to. They have young children, they may not let them play on the ground because uh, exposure to contaminated soil uh, uh, or dust and tra dragged into the home are toxic to the child. People in contaminated cities now wear pollution masks. Uh, in addition to that, there's time in many situations that's demanded to be spent dealing with the problems. And that also is a change of uh, lifestyle. And of course, if people become ill, uh, ill health drives lots of changes of lifestyle. And all these things are associated with changes of meaning of life. And they may be temporary, they may be permanent changes, um, but they're also tinged with the idea that they're forced on you. They're not voluntary changes. And that leads us into life strain, or how we deal with the stress that results from turbulence. There are a variety of coping challenges here. Um, and uh, let me just say that in any situation, uh, depending on how it unfolds, it may take a while before people accept it. So the perception of the situation unfolds. Incubation is before when, when a hazard exists but nobody is aware of it. It may be discovered and announced and there may be a lag time before some people accept it. Some people never accept it. Uh, and We can get into a current political conversation uh, on that front. Um, so uh, acceptance is an issue. Uh, some people are very defended against these changes. Some people accept them very readily, but usually there has to be a series of uh, steps before people accept them. Once they do, there's a shift to some kind of perpetual abnormality. Uh, there are all kinds of stress and coping impacts that people have to deal with. Um, they uh, 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 may not have the coping resources to, uh, to deal with the situation, so they may actually um, be exceeded in their coping resources, or they have to pull uh, their resources from other areas to deal with the situation. It's a new reality. There's a culture shock that comes with that. Uh, 
There's often a change psychological well-being, anticipatory fears of what may happen. And oftentimes we see psychological and social dysfunctions that occur. And people are affected, importantly, both by what has happened, the turbulence that's happened, but also the social response to the turbulence, which inevitably has its own consequences. And this leads us to the area of changed relational dynamics, which is another component of this, which is that uh, people find their relational network often inadequate in turbulent situations just because nobody uh, has the resources or ability to really help. They turn to experts, uh, to government, to, uh, to people who can help, and that process causes them to be disabled in the way I was talking about before. Uh, now their own knowledge is irrelevant. They, they need someone else to tell them whether they're safe or not. Um, they are subject to environmental stigma where there may be prejudice against them because of prejudice against a contaminated environment. Um, they may engage in enabling responses, which is what I refer to as when uh, people individually but often collectively begin to work to try to take control of the situation back when in fact uh, government or others are not helping them adequately. And there's a great deal of energy and effort um, and stress that goes into uh, to that process as well, uh, even though there may be some great uh, personal growth. People become forced into new roles and actions. Uh, there's maybe a lot of community conflict that occurs because not everybody's interests coincide around uh, what's needed to address the turbulence. People find that outsiders don't understand because the cultural situation that people who are involved in turbulence are plunged into may not translate to people who are not in the same situation, and therefore there's a disconnect between how others respond and what people feel they need. Uh, frequently, there's a sense of environmental injustice, and oftentimes they be plunged, become plunged into limbo because, in fact, uh, the situations don't have a ready um, uh, answer, and they may uh, go on and persist for generations uh, with people not getting out of the situation. And finally, uh, of all the, the, the theoretical components I could lay out, and there are many of them, I want to just talk about life cycle for a moment which is that uh, in every situation one finds that uh, looking at life cycle, there are differential impacts. So one has to look obviously at children and, and young uh, and teenagers, young adults, parents and elders uh, differently because they're likely to be impacted quite, uh, quite differently in the situation. So that's just a quick run through of theory. Let me pause again and see if there are any questions. Great, we do have some questions, Michael. So Prem is asking, what are the major parameters to monitoring changes in the livelihood of project affected people after distribution of compensation? And how long should such monitoring be carried out? Well, in that specific situation, um, I think one of the interesting questions, well, one has to uh, to both monitor the people who receive compensation, but also understand the extent to which they live in social situations where maybe not everybody receives compensation. So receiving compensation is often a step toward some kind of community conflict. Uh, but uh, with regard to people who receive compensation, um, this is very context specific, so I'm, I'm uh, kind of out on a limb here. and be useful to, to learn more about the specific context. Uh, but the question is, do people use compensation to actually compensate for their losses? Um, is compensation well spent? But the question I would ask is, does compensation actually compensate for what's lost? And depending on the type of turbulence, there may not be a way of going back and restoring what was lost. And compensation may allow people to move forward. And so that's, I think, the interesting question. Does it allow people to move toward a new normalcy? And so you need to create a set of measures to really address that. How long do you need to look? Um, well, you know, there aren't often situations to look back. I, I recently had a chance to visit Love Canal again uh, after all these years, and uh, uh, it's a very different place now. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting to have a, this longitudinal perspective or this this revisiting perspective. I think that we need, in general, to monitor over time. So I, I would uh, I would always argue that one should do some long-term 
uh, monitoring. Um, so one would see there being a short-term, an interim, and perhaps a long-term measure that would be ideal. Uh, hopefully that's responsive. Michael, Janet wants to know, uh, how are those factors you've just discussed different for indigenous peoples who may already be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or other impacts of colonization such as sexual abuse, addiction, etc.? Well, I spoke about coping resources. I think that um, some people uh, are uh, sitting with a lot of ability to absorb new turbulence, new shocks, and some people have less. Uh, in my experience uh, working with indigenous people, um, they often don't have extraordinary resources to absorb uh, new shocks. And um, I, I um, we'll talk in a moment about what I call eco-historical context. Uh, but um, everybody has a context in which they view things. And with native peoples who've gone through colonization, they take uh, er uh, oftentimes everything back to the colonization experience because uh, new forms of human-caused turbulence are, in fact, extensions of that experience over time. And if you take a deep enough look, which uh, uh, indigenous people often do, uh, there's a connection there. So. Um, uh, th this is a, a, a real factor here. People are uh, riding on uh, uh, insults and harm that was done a long time ago, which is continuing in a new form. One has to build that into the assessment. It's, it's a real issue. Uh, Chris is asking a two-part question. How does your model account for the magnitude of impact, and how do you account for the varying resiliency of different communities? Uh, well, I, I'll talk about methods in one second, uh, but I, I do get a chance to understand the magnitude of the impact. Um, and so um, it, that becomes uh, pretty apparent. Um, it's an interesting thing, though. Um, the question of how much magnitude is required to have how much effect is, uh, is an interesting question. I don't have an easy answer to it, except to say that uh, I don't prejudge how, that question, uh, but certainly if there is a, a, a larger magnitude, one has to address that, and uh, one has to be able to follow that through uh, with the consequences that one sees uh, people uh, experiencing. And again, I'll discuss that in a moment when I get into methods of how I try to do that. And one more question, and we will have two more opportunities for questions, so please keep posting them in the, question, uh, the chat box in your control panel. Uh, next to looking at age, is gender also taken into account? Oh, yes. I, I only showed a small number of factors uh, because uh, my original version of this presentation was about six hours long. Um, gender, of course, is important. and. Uh, uh, it um, shows up in every way, and I, I, I made a reference to it in my conversation that I was recalling with Addie Levine, uh, but that was one of the first things that we talked about were, were gender uh, issues, and uh, they are always uh, apparent, and they're always important, and uh, always something that you pay attention to very carefully. Okay, Mike. Michael, why don't you go ahead and continue with your presentation? We'll take questions right before the case study. Well, by the way, I would love to answer each of these questions for 10 minutes and really go into them more thoroughly, but uh, I'm pressed by time. But I, I think they're wonderful questions, and they, they do deserve more unpacking. Maybe we'll have some time to get to them uh, further. Um, so um, when I was working on high-level nuclear waste siting issues in the early 1980s, uh, I had to confront a question, which is, what do I actually study? Are the impacts occurring to individuals? Are they occurring to families? Are they occurring to communities? So who is actually being impacted, and where do I start doing research? And I developed what uh, has come to be known as the social process and eco-historical context model, uh, actually uh, during a, a one-hour uh, break um, uh, in a meeting uh, back then in Mississippi, and um, uh, I've used it ever since. I think it uh, uh, helps me uh, think about this issue. First of all, let me talk about eco-historical context. 
although I made a reference to it in answering the question about native peoples. Um, there's always a historical cultural context that exists in any community and it, uh, in, in the case of when I thought about this, what spurred it was that we were in southern Mississippi looking at a candidate high-level nuclear waste site community. And when you interviewed people, what, all they could really talk about was the Civil War. Uh, They're putting everything in the framework of having lost the Civil War and having a high-level nuclear waste site located in their community. It's fascinating, and uh, it got me to really think about the importance of historical dynamics, and it's always come in handy ever since. The ecological dynamics are also extremely important. You'll see this in the case study that I'll use later, uh, but uh, basically uh, everything occurs according to what experience people have with environmental issues and environmental problems. Uh, and as to the social process, the model in the uh, uh, middle, um, one could be studying individuals, one could be studying societies. Where does one put one's emphasis? But what I realized is that you can't choose. You've got to actually pay attention to all of them and follow whatever you're studying wherever it needs to go. Because psychosocial impacts, as I say here on the left, occur at all levels of social process. Those levels are nested. They're interactive and they're independent. You can't extract an individual from, uh, from the model, nor can you have a society without individuals. Uh, dynamics at any level influence the others, and any level of process is influenced by other levels. Uh, so I use this model as a guide in all the work that I do, and I think uh, uh, I wish I could unpack it longer, but I think it's extremely useful. Uh, in my work, I tend to use qualitative methods. I'm trained as a quantitative researcher, uh, but I really feel that in most situations, uh, the depth I need to get to, I cannot reach with quantitative methods, and I don't tend to use them. Um, I tend to focus in my work on the people who are most severely impacted. And uh, of course, one could uh, uh, sample uh, populations to f in different ways, but I tend to sample primarily looking at the people where uh, the impact is the most intense. Uh, I always try to tour the area of impact and to be there physically. Uh, and I also review all the documents that are related to an issue, even if there are thousands of pages of them. I developed a tailor, tailored interview format uh, specific to the case, to the situation. Um, and uh, the, there may be different questions for different subsamples. My main uh, mode of uh, gathering information is family interviews, which are intensive interviews that I like to do with intact families, if they are available, uh, in their homes, where I'm talking about how they're impacted by the turbulence with the entire family, and those interviews can last for five or six hours. They can be very long. I also match that with unrelated group interviews, which are chosen to bring out particular questions or uh, illuminate particular questions I'm interested in in that particular situation. Uh, I use my questions as a stimulus to conversation rather than a strict template, because I think the narrative is what's important here. And in fact, in the analysis I do, I do what I call a longitudinal analysis, which is I create a transcript which can be read as a narrative. Uh, and uh, that narrative structure is important to what things mean, because uh, it's a context for the answers that people give. But I also do a cross-sectional analysis where I do a thematic content analysis. Let me just note that I started doing qualitative research before it was accepted. I was always attacked for doing it, and I developed my own methodology. Uh, now, of course, it's in every textbook, and it's a completely accepted approach. Uh, the approach I use uh, for analysis is compatible with what uh, the state of the art is, but I, I had to create it on my own. Now, sometimes it's warranted to do some quantitative research, particularly if there's some, um, uh, if it looks like we can tease out uh, some differences relating to uh, psychological characteristics that are uh, identified uh, with um, measures that have validity uh, identified for them. And in that case, I, I bring in a colleague. I've uh, done this a number of times with some wonderful colleagues who do independent studies doing uh, controlled uh, quantitative research. And then we look at the convergence between that research and the qualitative work that I do. I look at actually everything that I've done for convergence, and if, if things don't fit together, you know you need to look more 
closely, but when they fit together, you have a great deal of confidence. Uh, the last thing I want to say about methodology has to do with study design. Uh, this shows a retrospective study design where you're trying, for example, in a toxic tort to understand what happened to a community that was impacted by a contamination event that happened some time ago. Uh, you try and create a baseline here by looking before the point of turbulence, and you reconstruct what people's lives were like, what, what was their uh, lifestyle like, what was their lifescape like, what was their emotional life like before the uh, turbulence occurred. Uh, and then uh, you're, of course, assessing the current frame, and you can project into the future. Uh, but it's that difference between the current frame and the baseline that shows the, uh, the impact. Uh, of course, if you're doing an anticipatory study, the baseline is the current frame, so it's much simpler. So um, I just quickly ran through my methods, but I will accept uh, questions if anyone has any. Great. We do have several. Catherine's asking, how does psychosocial impact assessment differ from mental well-being impact assessment or mental health impact assessment? And to what extent are any of your measures or methods clinical as opposed to social or sociological? Uh, great, great question. Uh, I am not a clinician. And I, um, uh, of course, there are, are some clinical measures that are in the, the broad literature, and you can just use the measures. Uh, but I am not a clinician. But um, uh, a lot of these issues do correspond. Uh, and uh, as I said, if I'm in a situation where I see psychological dysfunction and indications of uh, uh, psychological health issues, uh, I, uh, first of all, will make recommendations um, uh, that uh, the people seek treatment. But I also, uh, if there's an opportunity to to do measures of that, I will do it. And we've hired clinicians uh, to, uh, to work with populations that I uh, have studied, uh, and again, to come up with uh, independent uh, evaluations. Uh, and we've uh, uh, used quantitative measures quite extensively in parallel studies. Uh, but I don't tend to do that myself. Um, I think that um, what happens is that there's a tendency to collapse psychosocial impact in those situations into uh, DSM uh, measurements, into things that uh, have been identified as uh, indications of psychopathology. And I, I don't want to go in that direction initially. I think that um, uh, the impacts are much broader than that. Uh, but certainly, psychological dysfunction does occur. And I want to see it studied, if I can, uh, in these situations. And uh, so I think it's an important point. It's, uh, if one's putting together a team to do work, I would al always include uh, people to do that work. Haney is asking, what is the difference between communities therapy and psychosocial impact assessment? And also, what is the main tool in psychosocial impact assessment? Well, psychosocial impact assessment is a research tool. Uh, so I'm describing a methodology where one goes and documents uh, impacts, uh, and uh, in identifying them, one tries to either influence a decision being made about citing a facility, or in uh, the case of a retrospective analysis, perhaps uh, creating a basis for compensation, or for a legal decision, uh, or for uh, uh, there being some kind of health monitoring, or some kind of uh, mitigation. and. Uh, so this is a specific tool for identifying what the issues are. Any intervention into a community to try to solve problems is important. I don't tend to get into that in my psychosocial impact assessment work. I have gotten into it a number of times uh, in a variety of ways, but that's not the focus of my work. My work is really on identifying the impacts. I think that the intervention that would be identified to try to address issues is best identified around understanding what the issues are. I'm going to digress into a quick example. Uh, there's a community that I have not worked with, but it's in my own uh, county, and I would actually love to, uh, to work on it, uh, where there is uh, a, a, a newly identified toxin, which is appearing all over uh, the place, uh, identified in the water system. Uh, it's a toxin that people can be tested to see if they have it in their bodies,
and the stage has tested and found that lots of people have this toxin in their bodies. Uh, well, that creates an interesting and really unfortunate situation, which is that while it's important to test for it, uh, the question is, uh, what do you do then? And uh, uh, I, in my work, refer to what I call a mitigatory gap, which is what happens when you uh, create a situation in which mitigation is required, but you don't have anything up your sleeve uh, to do. Now you have people who know that they have been impacted, but, uh, but uh, how do you actually help them address that situation? Uh, that's just a quick example of how uh, understanding the impacts can help you figure out how to manage an overall community intervention uh, so that you try to avoid mitigatory gaps or at least address them knowing that they're going to happen. Uh, next question. Uh, Susan's asking, in doing retrospective assessments in highly conflictive or traumatic situations, how do you control for the risk that people reconstruct, in quotes, the past through their current understanding of the risk? Well, people always do some reconstruction of the past. Uh, but the whole idea of trying to reconstruct a baseline is to go back uh, before they were aware of it. And uh, in the interviews, uh, one has to really push people uh, back into that space. Um, you have to be aware that you can't take people out of the reality that they're now in. Uh, and that becomes a potential bias and factor. Uh, but at the same time, um, there was a life that these people led before these events occurred. And uh, looking at documents, um, when you're in people's homes, you can go through their picture books and you can talk about uh, situations that, uh, that, that allow people to, to recollect. Uh, you do your best to try to get back to uh, what people's understanding of their lives were and the way they lived their lives previously. And I, I think you can actually do that pretty well. The other thing is, is that you, in most situations, are not relying on a small group or, or um, an individual, you're relying on a larger group and you can begin to look at uh, patterns across people. And also if you've worked in enough communities you get a, kind of a second sense about these issues. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, the, the current understanding of your situation uh, is a biasing factor in terms of how you can initially reconstruct what's, what came before. You, you always idealize the past uh, based on what you've lost. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you can do that reconstruction in a way that's useful enough to, uh, to be valid. Uh, why, why don't I move on now and take uh, questions in the next stop? Sounds great. Uh, I'm just worried I uh, have to watch my time here. So um, I wanted to give a case study, and I, I prepped uh, five or so case studies up until uh, the day before yesterday and then had to decide which one to give. And I chose this one because it, it touched on enough of the application of the methodology in a situation that people might confront in many different communities. Uh, this is a case from Alberta, Canada of gas extraction and transmission. Uh, in 2010, uh, Shell Oil proposed what was called the Waterton 68 gas well. Uh, this is in an area near Waterton National Park in southern Alberta. Uh, Americans would know Waterton Park as Glacier National Park. It's the same geographic area. So it's a magnificent, beautiful area. And there were lots of residents and recreationalists there who went into an administrative hearing opposed to this project. Uh, and they raised the issue of psychosocial impact assessment as something they wanted to see uh, studied and testified on as a, an issue. Uh, they were successful in getting that issue listed. Uh, and I was um, asked to uh, supply that testimony. In September 2010, I uh, submitted pre-filed testimony, a 175-page document called Anticipated Psychosocial Impacts to Proximate Residents and Recreationalists from the Shell Waterton 68 Project. And uh, then I testified before the Alberta Energy Resource Conservation Board that October. So um, this uh, aerial photograph from Google Earth uh, shows something important about the eco-historical context here, which is that this uh, wilderness area, at least in this area, which is uh, called uh, Seven Gates Road, uh, is been converted into a uh, 
a wilderness industrial zone. There are many uh, gas wells and gas pipelines here already. And Waterton 68, which I believe is the well uh, at the bottom, um, or the site at the bottom, is uh, not the first by any stretch uh, uh, industrial intervention into this area. In fact, the area was originally a coal mining area. And uh, so uh, the study I undertook was to address the threats to residents' quality of life and psychosocial well-being defined in terms of adverse cognitive, behavioral, and emotional changes that can be expected if the proposed well is approved. And I went to look at the impacts of existing gas facilities in the same area as a basis for projecting the likely consequences for, from Waterton 68, because in fact, there are similar facilities affecting similar people in a similar area. Um, this is the emergency planning um, zone map uh, surrounding uh, the uh, uh, proposed site. Uh, and I, I show that uh, because it'll come up in conversation. But uh, what I did is I was able to spend two days of very detailed guided tours in the area in August of 2010. I then did five intensive interviews held with a total of 16 proximate residents, most of them living in this emergency uh, protection zone. And then I did a group interview with a group of recreationalists. Uh, that was all uh, we could really squeeze out in terms of uh, research. But it was, it was sufficient. Um, and I, I want to touch on the risk personality. I didn't, I left this out of my theory talk, but every uh, type of uh, uh, contamination has its own risk personality, and every turbulence has its own personality. And there are known risks associated with it. There are also a variety of unknowns and uncertainties, but there are certain things we know. And the thing that is important to know here is that uh, some of the gas here uh, was high in uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, it's called sour gas. And uh, hydrogen sulfide is extremely deadly upon exposure and uh, has a variety of somatic symptoms uh, with nausea, headaches, and uh, effects to eye and lung irritation. Um, and so we're dealing with a, a toxic substance here that's potentially deadly. Uh, and uh, SO2 is also present in the area, which can also be uh, deadly and have many side effects. And there are other hazardous chemicals involved in this process. I also wanted to lay out at the beginning that there was a milestone event. Uh, in any situation, you want to understand when people began accepting the fact that um, uh, there was uh, a particular threat or hazard associated with the situation they now find themselves in. And in this case, there was a 2007 pipeline rupture, which really was the milestone. Um, in 2007, uh, a month before that rupture, Shell got the likelihood of it happening very remote, and then it happened a month later, of course. Uh, and this was a major turning point because this was a hydrogen sulfide release event. Uh, it showed a breakdown of Shell's emergency response plan, which is really what's supposed to keep people safe. And the emergency planning zone and event modeling done during the event were uh, errant, they were wrong. Gas was found uh, in what I'll refer to as an area called south of Mount Bacchus without Shell knowing that it was there. There were residents exposed at the rupture site as well as uh, elsewhere. Uh, there was a failed notification within the emergency planning zone for some people. Uh, other people called in and found no information. Uh, this quote from one of the people, they called and said it was safe to return to our place. Well, we never got the first phone call that we shouldn't be there. Uh, the idea of shelter in place, which is very central to uh, how uh, industries that are hazardous expect people to protect themselves, was doubted uh, based on the outcomes of this. Uh, a post-release study was done by Shell, which people felt didn't clarify or correct lapses. And out of this, residents came to doubt Shell's ability to detect, notify, and protect residents. And uh, subsequently, the emergency planning zone was also shrunk, which uh, did, did not uh, gain much confidence in people. So with that said, um, let me talk about uh, the Mount Bacchus issue. There's an interesting geographic divide uh, that I discovered 
uh, relating to this mountain called Mount Bacchus. On the north side of Mount Bacchus in the Seven Gates Road area that I showed in that aerial photograph, uh, the Screwdriver River Valley, there was intense proximity and cumulative exposure to uh, gas wells and uh, pipelines for the people living there. Uh, their wilderness had been severely interrupted uh, and they were in the emergency planning zone. They were subject to many direct impacts as well as the threat of releases. Uh, when the uh, event did occur in 2007, they were close to it and they had been evacuated because of such events. Um, in contrast, uh, south of Mount Bacchus, where this uh, bucolic picture at the bottom uh, was taken, uh, the gas issues seemed very far away. Uh, wilderness um, was uninterrupted. Uh, people's expectations of living in nature were intact. Uh, most people were out of the emergency planning zone, although not all. They were pretty shielded from the direct impacts. They felt far away from the incident that occurred and they had not mostly been evacuated. So they had different experiences, but there were two great equalizers. The first was that 2007 pipeline rupture in which uh, somehow um, unexpected to shell and against all the models, uh, the uh, gas that was released made its way to the south side of Mount Bacchus. And then this water, Waterton 68 proposal also became an equalizer. Uh, both sides of Mount Bacchus were now engaged. Um, so they had very different experiences, just to continue this point. People living on the north side, as you saw from that aerial photograph, had many gas wells around them. Each of those gas wells was connected by pipelines. There were many tests done, uh, uh, periodically requiring uh, trucks. There were always gas company trucks going back and forth. Uh, if failures occurred, they had to be studied. Uh, re releases periodically occurred, so people smelled gas fairly frequently. Uh, there was lots of remedial work that continually had to be done requiring crews being out there, tampering with the equipment. And there were lots of demands for participation in working with Shell and other companies that had facilities there. So people were constantly being pulled into uh, being uh, engaged in these issues. And all of this occurred with a great psychosocial cost because adaptation can occur, but it, it has cost. Um, and north, I mean south of Mount Bacchus, people had anticipatory fears based on that 2007 leak. They observed what happened to the neighbors on the other side of Mount Bacchus. And they also had this map that I have over here on the right that was uh, later withdrawn, which suggested that many more wells, wells would come uh, south of Mount Bacchus uh, as part of this uh, Waterton 68 expansion. So we can use the framework that I talked about before to try and uh, look at this, and I'll try and move through this quickly so we can have time for Q&A. Uh, virtually everybody I spoke with believed that Waterton 68 threatened immediate death, impairment, and injury, and contributed to the possibility of long-term latent complications. Uh, one quote, the health issues are greater than what Shell that's on, and maybe we're affected already, according to experts who came from the last hearing. Small effects over time affect memory and things in the body we're not aware of. Uh, and what if you were right by a leak when it happens and got full strength H2S? People lost a sense of control in the situation. They reported powerlessness, loss of control, no clear way forward, uh, no way to know what to do. Uh, they were in dilemmas. Uh, just some examples. We're being forced into action by somebody else's agenda. We do not get help from government. At times, I feel we should just move. And they say that the things that affect our safety are things like bears. Well, we knew that before we bought our places. We don't need to be safe from the environment that was here when we got here, uh, but we can't do anything about sour gas in the air. And we want to continue as a business, and even if we want to stay here, it's depressing. I do not know how we could move because no one will buy our property surrounded by seven wells, or if you move now or wait, or how do we even deal with this? It sort of ruins our whole reason for being here in the, the, in the peacefulness and a retreat lifestyle of serenity. That speaks then to the inversion of home. Uh, virtually everyone I spoke with had spent a great deal of time searching for a tranquil location with scenic nature. And uh, the people north of Mount Bacchus, when they had moved to the area, uh, 
there was not active uh, gas uh, wells and um, extraction going on at that point in time. There had been some historic work. Uh, but like the people south of Mount Bacchus, they moved there with an expectation they were moving into nature. It took me half my life to find this place. I had been all over Canada and did not find a nicer place to live. And after that, I spent 20 years building this place up. You don't want to leave. But that same person now had lost their motivation for their home. And their wife pointed out, just look at the house. Tom worked in the house before, but it hasn't touched it for many years. A frequent uh, uh, issue with inversion of home. Then there's the question of how people relate to the environment. Um, gas spoils their contact with nature, which is what living here was all about. I used to like to hike there every day, now I hardly do. When I'm out in the wilderness, I like to think that I'm the first person to walk in this place, uh, thinking that it's not affected by too many people or traffic in the wilderness. But then I come over the ridge, and there's a well site, and I'm jerked back into reality, and I've lost the experience. Uh, the, the quote below I won't read, but uh, basically he's pulled back by the howling of uh, pumps in an oil facility, a gas facility. Now, of course, there are anticipatory fears that arose after that pipeline uh, 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 rupture. In the first quote, which I won't read the whole way, uh, the person is uh, riding around in an ATV, and they're always along pipelines and near well sites, and they realize that if something happens, uh, their cell phones may not work, and they may be uh, caught up in it. It's in their mind. They ride into nature, but all they think about is the risk. Uh, the bottom one. When I take off with my friend to go horseback riding, um, you kind of think about it, but you, um, you uh, I actually can't read what's there because um, my control panel is covering it, uh, but you don't think about it. Uh, but when the blowout happened, it tells me that this is real. It is really going to happen someday. Uh, so when we're off riding, it goes through my mind. People's livelihood can be affected. Um, ecotourism, people being concerned about whether people will come to, uh, to their facility knowing that they might have to be evacuated for hydrogen sulfide or they might be exposed. A an artist who uh, gets pulled out into public hearings for weeks at a time from her art and who drives her art from the beauty of the nature around her. A farmer whose cattle were impacted by the 2007 release and uh, lost a lot of calves and uh, had a lot of uh, um, infertility. All of this affects people's sense of trust. They've uh, dispelled their ideas that the government is protective, decisions are rational, people are treated fairly. Uh, and uh, so the first view is a statement of uh, a cynical sense about Alberta. Uh, but people are also very cynical about Shell. The second quote uh, is how Shell makes donations, make donations after the, uh, uh, the release uh, to offset whatever uh, uh, loss of confidence had occurred because of uh, the release. Uh, can they buy their way to uh, salving over uh, that uh, H2S release? All of this also leads to adverse lifestyle impacts. People's lives are captured by gas development. And you see this primarily north of Mount Bacchus at the moment. There are direct impacts, motors dust, traffic noise, blaring two-way radios, people intruding constantly, uh, lots of visual impacts, you can uh, at night lights. Uh, leaks are surprisingly common, and people end up being the ones who detect them and end up calling in the smells. But of course, by the time someone comes to investigate them, they can no longer detect it. People no longer want to take hikes or ride their horses or paint. Um, and as I said, they're de facto monitors. And they participate in hearings that are stacked decks and very stressful. But at the same time, if they settle and don't enter the hearings, then they lose control over the situation. And they're continually put in a uh, bind about whether to participate in the constant demands to be drawn in. A at the right, I, I illustrate that where we talk about the demands to participate in stressful meetings with gas companies. Uh, I won't read this whole thing, but if you take a moment and look at it, since 2006, just with the Shell Waterton 68's proposal, this one family um, went into uh, a continued series of meetings with Shell and with neighbors and with government about the facility. And um, all of these meetings take time, the person said. 
time we'd rather be spending on other things. And Shell is only one of the extraction companies uh, and pipeline companies in this area. Others also demand meetings. So this takes a major bite out of lifestyle. Of course, there's a lot of stress associated with all of this that people have to actively cope with. And um, some of those adjustments are unhealthy. Uh, there's a lot of stress placed on family relationships. Uh, some of the couples that I spoke with became closer together out of this, uh, but some were pushed apart. There's also community conflict. Shell's a major employer, and uh, if you are successful in shifting a gas site, you may shift it into someone else's backyard and create conflict with them. People had continued exposures to noxious and unhealthy conditions. They were worried about livelihood, their ability to retire, their property values. There was a diminished quality of health, life and enjoyment associated with residency in the region. And some people had a fear of all the people working on the facilities, uh, the fear of outsiders, strangers who might be unsafe. But lots of sources of life strain here. Environmental stigma was a major factor as well. Having a potentially lethal gas uh, uh, in your area, uh, lots of noxious conditions, loss of privacy and tranquility, harm to the reputation of the area, which might affect the ability to attract ecotourists and the desire of recreationalists to be in the area, uh, affect the value and market interest in property, with the result that people might be stuck in place, have their retirements put off, and people who were ready to leave their property to their children, not sure they want their children there. Recreationally, this is uh, this uh, area north of Mount Bacchus is right up against the Castle Crown region, which is renowned for ecotourism. Lots of recreationalists moving through the region. More than 300 uh, camp beds uh, in the immediate area. Uh, concerns by the recre recreationalists about the loss of wilderness value and active use. Uh, but on the practical side, uh, as I saw when two cyclists uh, went past uh, me uh, when I was on my tour, uh, recreational populations can't be notified or protected if there's a gas release. And the residents uh, also uh, are recreationalists as well, and they're out in this environment and uh, have the same problem, which is they can't be contacted. So cumulatively speaking, if you did a cumulative impact assessment and you look at the eco-historical context, you realize that adding one more well uh, is not just adding one more well. The, is the assumption that this area is already so affected by this industrialized landscape that one more won't hurt anything? I didn't find that that was true. I found rather that one more would uh, be the straw that broke the camel's back. That in fact, people are so saturated with impacts uh, that in fact, uh, there needs to be a real evaluation about whether one adds to that level of impact. So I made recommendations to the administrative hearing. Uh, that there be a permit denial based on psychosocial impacts, that steps be taken to mitigate the impacts that already existed from uh, the facilities that were there, and that only if those impacts could be mitigated would there be future gas development, and that all the cumulative uh, impacts be assessed as together. Uh, the citizens testified um, uh, that I accurately reflected their impacts in my testimony, but my results infuriated the uh, Energy Resource Conservation Board Administrative Panel of Judges. Uh, I had already irritated them with a prior decision, and they punished me by denying my fees. Uh, and the reason for that was not just to punish me, but also to punish the residents, because if experts uh, could not be compensated, then in fact, in, uh, interventions by citizens would be stopped, and uh, that was something they were trying to achieve. Uh, I have uh, attempted subsequently to uh, work on this issue because I'd love to get my fees back, but the ERCB was subsequently replaced by a new agency, and uh, uh, the question here is really about whether uh, residents in Alberta uh, at this point in time were really being denied their right to intervene in hearings uh, to protect their interests, and a major step back was occurring. Uh, but clearly the impacts were here and needed to be addressed, and I was able to bring them forward. So just to conclude, the issues seen in Alberta are pretty universal. There's 
certainly projects like this occurring everywhere with fracking, gas and oil extractions expanded around the globe, uh, even as we try to uh, reframe for uh, climate uh, and renewables. Uh, the case illustrates the use of my method and theory uh, used in a pretty rapid way to come up with a, a pretty thorough analysis of the impacts in a community. The outcome of the case, uh, of course, also illustrates resistance to psychosocial impact assessment for regulators who don't want to empower citizens in a way that would block projects that their mission is to permit. But I think it's time to broaden the practice of PSIA and to take on this rejection and to uh, build the field so that it has influence because, in fact, victimization occurs broadly. It needs to be documented and it needs to be addressed. And uh, so uh, I hope that uh, in our conversation right now in Q&A, but in ongoing conversations, uh, I can inspire you to continue your work in this area. I'd like to learn uh, what work you've already done and to help you uh, take major steps into doing psychosocial impact assessment. Thank you very much. Great. So, Thank questions. Thank you, Michael. We do have some questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the time that's remaining. We want to be conscientious of your time as a 90-minute webinar. However, Michael will try to get to as many of them offline that we don't answer um, after the webinar as he can. So let's get started without delay. Ken says that the personal anecdotes with Shell are powerful. For companies and regulators steeped in quantitative analysis, do you find much evidence that this array of qualitative data helps change their mindsets with more sympathy to inform their decisions? I have had different experiences. Uh, my experience in Alberta with the two cases I did there was terrible. Um, that agency was completely closed. Uh, but I've had mixed experiences, some of them positive and some of them not. Uh, what um, I, I just uh, talk about my uh, a recent case, uh, this, uh, well, I guess it's five years ago already, where I testified on the environmental justice impacts potentially associated with uh, repermitting the Indian Point nuclear power plants outside of New York City. And um, uh, it's one of the case studies I almost used, uh, but I ended up uh, uh, doing a study of Sing Sing Prison, where the inmates are within the 10-mile emergency planning zone of Indian Point to address the question of what would happen to them if there was a radioactive release. And uh, it was a fascinating uh, study to do. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the judges from the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board were, were open to uh, really understanding that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did not know how to address environmental justice issues. And uh, they were interested in how you bore down into uh, these issues to the point of getting some real insight. And uh, I'm not sure that they were driven by empathy, although it would be nice. Uh, but I think they were driven by really trying to understand what would happen inside a maximum security prison uh, that uh, was sheltered uh, in a situation where there was a radioactive release and uh, uh, what were the potentials for losing control of the prison uh, and how could bad things happen to inmates and guards as a result of that. They were very much interested in those dynamics. So uh, I think it is possible to get uh, judges uh, interested in, in these situations uh, and the details uh, help. And again, people stand up at hearings all the time and talk about uh, their view of these things and they're dismissed as just their own private opinions. But some of us as experts are able to make judgments about whether uh, those uh, private opinions in fact are generalizable? Do they in fact relate to a, a body of information that gives us confidence in a type of impact that really is significant and has substance and should be recognized? And the more we bring that forward, I think the more we will get sympathetic ears, uh, even if it's not out of empathy, uh, but more out of trying to understand just what, uh, what needs to be weighed in a decision before it's made. Maria 
comments that you associate psychosocial impact assessment to contamination situations and events after the problem is evident. How can psychosocial impact assessment be used to strengthen individual and community psycho resilience? And what are arguments to make psychosocial impact assessment to be used as a precautionary approach? Well, I, I, I love that, uh, that thinking. Uh, I tend, uh, in many of the examples I use, to talk about contamination. Uh, but I've used this uh, in a variety of disaster situations or what I refer to as unhappy situations. But, but when you the, ask the question, Maria, is you're talking about how you build resistant, uh, resilience. And uh, I think that uh, what's interesting to me is the extent to which what I refer to, the, refer to as the enabling response uh, occurs uh, in so many situations where people have been disempowered by what's happened to them uh, they're being harmed or they've been harmed. Uh, they don't have uh, their own resources, their own social no networks aren't able to help them. Government is often disappointing. Uh, and uh, it's seemingly they're uh, at sea. Uh, and people find this amazing capacity to uh, learn into a situation and master it. Uh, and time and time and time again, I've seen this in a, a wide variety of situations where people come back as amazing leaders. They've learned how to deal with the technical jargon and understand the complex issues. But more importantly, they've learned how to network with other people in similar situations and with experts and with legal help. And they marshal all the resources that's available to them. And that kind of construction of an active community has always fascinated me. Uh, to some extent, uh, some of it dissipates when a disaster or a particular situation is addressed, or people come to grips with it, or they become tired, or they become caught in limbo, and, and you see some of that uh, uh, emergent grassroots effort uh, dissipates. On the other side of the coin, uh, we see uh, worldwide with the whole sustainability movement a proactive aspect of this uh, that is focused on building resilience and is focused on addressing issues and not driven by reaction to turbulence and uh, or, or driven by the prospect of long-term turbulence uh, but wanting to uh, create resilient structures uh, that are anticipatory and uh, will, will help uh, if, in fact, turbulence occurs. And I, I think that there's a great deal to learn from these reactive situations for those proactive situations. Uh, and, you know, in my own practice, I spend a lot of time on sustainability issues. Uh, I, I don't particularly use psychosocial impact assessment uh, in that proactive work. But what I've learned from the reactive situations is what gives me an understanding of the proactive situations. And one of the problems I see is that oftentimes people aren't motivated until something bad happens. Uh, until the rug is pulled out from under them, uh, they're standing right where they were standing before. So there's always the question of how you motivate people, how you get people involved. Um, and I think that it's bridging, uh, in the world we live today, the reactive to the proactive that becomes the motivation. Uh, as with climate change, uh, we have uh, we have to build resilience. Uh, we know that things are going to happen, and we have to prepare for them. Uh, it's that uh, reaction to the turbulence that's coming, uh, and uh, the confidence in it that gives people the motivation to respond. Uh, so um, I, I think this transfer to proactive work is an extremely important part of this. I'm glad it, uh, Maria brought it up. One last question. How should decision makers or society deal with a finding of strong psychosocial impacts experienced by a small number of people, but no psychosocial impacts among the vast majority of the community? Well, it's often the case uh, that uh, the epicenter of impact is narrow. Although the issue of how you bound the impact is always of interest to me because so frequently it's not bounded in a way that actually works. Uh, the, the 
the people people are impacted who are outside where we think the boundaries are. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, the, the the challenge there is that the people who are severely impacted, their impacts do need to be addressed, um, and oftentimes they can be mitigated. Uh, not always. Um, and they can only be mitigated if they're understood. So I think the purpose of social impact assessment, a psychosocial impact assessment in this situation, is to give enough information that we can, in fact, see whether we can mitigate those impacts. Uh, a, a regulator having to decide between the interests of a large group of people not impacted, but who may benefit, and a small group who are adversely impacted uh, has to be weighed and, and uh, it has to be uh, taken in the direction of uh, solving the issues for the few, um, uh, even as they are concerned about the many. Uh, too often in the current frame, we just overlook the few and we just uh, uh, move forward towards solutions that work for many people uh, but uh, that are disastrous for some. And of course, in the long run, uh, those of us who benefit in those situations, as we all do, they find ourselves among the few who are harmed uh, at some point in the future. So it behooves all of us to actually develop a, uh, an anticipatory system that documents and understands these impacts and really thinks about what you do in the situation. Oftentimes, uh, uh, there may have to be a residential uh, opportunities to, uh, for people to move. Uh, but projects can be changed uh, to mitigate. Uh, lots of times regulation is not strict and a lot of problems occur because uh, the permits may in fact be strict, but nobody's enforcing them. Um, there needs to be methods of recourse for the people in the community. In my nonprofit life, I've experimented with this a number of times. Uh, we've created uh, groups from the affected community who are uh, invited to meet with the, uh, the the people who run the, the projects that are causing the adverse impacts on a regular basis. In fact, it's even written into uh, the, uh, the permit as a party of interest process. And um, if those processes work properly, as we've had some success doing, uh, people are able to come in and say, look, these are the problems we're facing. You've got to solve them. And the regulator is sitting at the table as well. And if they're doing their job and those problems aren't solved, uh, then, uh, then the permit gets uh, modified or yanked. Uh, one other comment is that uh, we don't do enough with monitoring long term in terms of uh, impact assessment. And that's a, a problem that has to be addressed. Uh, but with psychosocial impact assessment, that long term monitoring also becomes very important. But monitoring of impacts in general allows for the possibility of addressing when things don't work. We design things to work, we permit them on the assumption they're going to work, uh, but very often things happen that aren't expected and we have to be able to address those emergent issues uh, if we're going to uh, protect people who are affected by those projects. So monitoring is a part of the solution as well. Okay, well thank you so much Michael for a great presentation. Uh, Michael, as I said, will try to respond to the questions we didn't get a chance to answer live. Um, he'll do that as a follow-up later as much as he can. Uh, I just wanted to remind you, you will get a notification about the webinar recording and the links to the survey uh, links to the handouts and the slides. I also invite you to check out our past webinars. You can find those on II's webpage. Just go to the resources tab and click training and you'll find a link to webinars there. Uh, so we know that your time is valuable and we hope that this webinar was valuable to you. We will see you next time. <laughs>